Welcome to Digest This, where we focus on day-to-day -day issues in gastroenterology. I'm Elaine Robertson, a gastroenterology trainee in the west of Scotland, and today we're discussing variceal bleeding. I'm joined by Dr Adrian Stanley, a consultant gastroenterologist and hepatologist in Glasgow Royal Infirmary, and a co-author of the recent BSG guideline entitled UK Guideline on the Management of Variceal Hemorrhage in Cirrhotic Patients. Welcome Dr Stanley. So variceal bleeding is clearly an important issue. Broadly speaking, how does the guideline approach the topic? Well, thanks for the invitation to talk. Um, we split the guideline into a section on the management of acute bleeding, the emergency situation, then a section on how you stop re-bleeding once you've managed the acute situation itself, then a section on primary prophylaxis in patients who have never bled before but you're actually giving therapy to stop a bleed happening and then finally a section on gastric variceal bleeding. So taking acute variceal bleeding first, the 2am nightmare for the gastroenterology registrar, can you take us through the initial approach to assessing and resuscitating the patient? Yes, well acute variceal bleeding is clearly a major medical emergency with a high mortality and therefore a senior doctor should be involved from the outset. Like any other medical emergency, you should go through the A, B and C uh, protocol, looking at the airway, breathing and circulation. High flow oxygen is given and as any concern about the airway, calling an anaesthetist early is logical and better for the patient. With regard to resuscitation with fluid, two large cannulae are needed and usually plasma expanders, Hartmann's or equivalents should be given. Looking and aiming for a systolic blood pressure of about 100 millimetres of mercury, if you go too high with systolic blood pressure, there is concern you raise the portal pressure and aggravate or cause further bleeding. With regard to blood transfusion, recent data suggested a relatively restricted blood transfusion policy is actually better with regard to patient outcome. A large Spanish study suggested that when you randomise patients to a transfusion on GI bleeding with a threshold of 7 grams per deciliter versus 9 grams per deciliter, the outcome in survival was better for the restrictive transfusion group and particularly in patients with variceal bleeding. And that may also be caused by the, uh, the worry about concerning over-transfusion in patients with portal hypertension. With regards to other blood products, in a patient with ongoing bleeding, if your platelet count is lower than 50, it makes sense and there's some data to support giving platelets so the data are not robust and of low quality. Likewise, if the INR is greater than 1.5, giving FFP in that situation is thought to be logical and of benefit, although the data are not great. So what about specific drug therapy? Okay, well there's good evidence from a mortality, uh, survival benefit rather, from drug therapy in the form of vasopressors and antibiotics. Routine use of antibiotics from a prophylactic nature have been shown to improve survival in these patients, and this is someone who's not proven to have sepsis, and the evidence shows that if you give five to seven days of a broad spectrum antibiotic, initially quinolones or cephalosporins, but more recently we've moved in many centres to Augmentin and you have to use it based on your local microbiology guidance. And interestingly in a 2007 UK audit, only 27% of Varices patients had prophylactic antibiotics which are easily given and survive, uh, improve survival. With regards to vasopressors, again many studies show a survival benefit from that being given early and again in the 2007 audit, only 44% of patients in the UK were given that therapy prior to variceal uh, bleeding being managed properly. So, I think these two relatively simple mechanisms can improve survival. The, the vasopressin most commonly used is terlipressin, 2 milligrams 4 to 6 hourly, and that's usually given until hemostasis is achieved or in some centres for up to five days depending on clinical acumen and judgement. And the timing of endoscopy and definitive endoscopic management? So there's a group of patients who clearly need endoscopy very early and the patients who have ongoing hemodynamic instability despite the initial resuscitation should be endoscoped as soon as resuscitation has been started and is underway and in that group anaesthetists should really be present. For other patients who are more stable but you're suspecting variceal bleeding they should be endoscoped the next morning and certainly within 24 hours. Some guidance would suggest within 12 hours but there's not any robust data to support that. When you do the endoscopy, if there is bleeding from esophageal varices, variceal band ligation is a therapy of choice. But the endoscopist in this situation has to be able to have the skills to also do glue injection if gastric varices are found or pass a sink stacking tube if necessary. 
So the skills of the endoscopist and they also support from staff such as nurses who know what they're doing, an anaesthetist and possibly an intervention radiologist if necessary in the building are important. And what if you can't get control endoscopically? So if bleeding is from esophageal varices and the endoscopist can't control the situation with band ligation, often a saying stacking tube should be put in as a temporising measure until you can organise the salvage tips, which is the best therapy of choice. Occasionally Danis stents have been used, but more data is needed to see whether they are beneficial in the longer term. And can you talk us through then the next few days after a variceal bleed, assuming that you've got control endoscopically? Okay, usually uh, the patient will be in an HDU or possibly an ITU environment, and we can come back to that if necessary later. But once you've controlled the initial bleed, most uh, authors and investigators would suggest that there's a five-day period that the acute bleed is managed in. So you have the terlipressin possibly going on for five days, antibiotics, etc. Once the patient is hematically stable for 24 hours or more, you can consider adding in drug therapy that comes under the secondary prophylaxis thing we'll come on to later, and you gradually withdraw lines and catheters that you might have in for monitoring purposes, and they can be moved down to a downstream ward at that time, depending on the clinical situation, obviously. Okay, well that leads us on to secondary prophylaxis. So what's the best method to prevent rebleeding? Uh, the evidence would suggest that a combination of non-selective beta blockers and band ligation is the optimal therapy for prevention of rebleeding. However, if you look at the meta-analysis, that sometimes, especially for mortality outcome, non-selective beta blockers alone, once you've controlled the acute bleed with band ligation, are actually uh, satisfactory and give similar mortality outcome. Likewise, an option could be for band ligation alone, particularly if people are intolerant or have contraindications in non-selective beta blockers. So we would suggest that a combination is probably the optimal therapy, but either alone would also be appropriate in certain situations. And what about TIPS? TIPS is usually best for a second-line therapy. Um, essentially, if people re-bleed despite the therapy we've given with drugs or whatever, and very occasionally you get a patient who is uh, very keen not to take band ligation for various reasons, or geographical reasons perhaps, and are contraindicated to non-selective beta blockers, then a TIPS could be uh, appropriate for that specific patient. So let's take a step back then to the cirrhotic patient in the clinic. Can you tell us a bit about the natural history of varices and the strategies for surveillance? Okay, so uh, a lot of the older studies suggested that if you had a compensated cirrhotic patient, about a third of them would have varices if you looked down with an endoscope and about two-thirds of patients with a decompensated cirrhosis at diagnosis with varices. And more recent data suggests that if you follow up a patient with cirrhosis for 10 years, over 50% of them will have varices developed over that time. And it largely depends on the grade of liver disease by the child's grade, whether there's major shunting uh, anatomically and what the hepatic venous pressure gradient is. And finally, if the insult such as alcohol intake or hepatitis C is ongoing, that increases the risk of varices formation. With regards to the actual risk of bleeding, if you know varices are there, if the varices are larger, if they've got red spots, and if the patient has a child's C patient, they're more, more at risk of bleeding in due course. So who should have surveillance and how often would you repeat the endoscopy? So I think every uh, cirrhotic patient should have an endoscopy to look for varices. Non-invasive tests such as fibre scan or even capsule endoscopy procedures are not of definite proven benefit at this point, although a lot of research is going particularly with fibre scan. So we'd endoscope every cirrhotic to see if they have varices. If they have no varices, we'd repeat the endoscopy in about two to three years, shorter period if they're more advanced liver disease, and maybe three years of their child's A. If you see small varices, they're probably not of benefit with regard to active therapy for primary prophylaxis, we'd repeat the endoscopy in one year. And if they've got grade two or three varices or have red spots in a grade one varix, we would recommend therapy. And what's the best method of primary prophylaxis? Okay, so non-selective beta blockers or band ligation have been shown to be of benefit versus uh, placebo over the years. Um, when you compare them against each other, the meta-analysis suggests that rebeating is less with band ligation, but mortality differences are not there between the two. But when you actually look at the more detail the better studies, the larger studies, the longer follow-up with band ligation versus non-selective beta blockers, there's no rebeating difference. And of course, if you do band ligation, it's more invasive, it's more expensive, and there have been reports of 
um, mortality due to band ligation ulcers in people who have been given it for primary prophylaxis. So the conclusion from all that would be that non-selective beta blockers, if the patient can tolerate them and have no contraindications, would be the method of choice with band ligation as a second line therapy. Okay, so let me take you back to the acute setting and the initial endoscopy. Let's imagine that gastric varices are found. Can you talk us through the differences in the endoscopic approach? Okay, it's important to note there's various types of gastric varices and they're usually split by the sarin classification into gastroesophageal varices type one, where the esophageal varices extend several centimeters down the lesser curve of the stomach. Gastroesophageal varices type two, where they extend into the fundus. Isolated gastric varices type one, where they're found just in the fundus. And isolated gastric varices type two, where they're found anywhere else in the stomach. If you do the endoscopy and you see bleeding from gastroesophageal varices type one along the lesser curve, you treat them as you would with esophageal variceal bleeding, i.e. variceal band ligation. If you see vape bleeding from gastric varices anywhere else, in the stomach, you would treat them with injection of hysteracryl, where most of the data is based, or thrombin injection, which are used in some centres. And what about follow-up? If you control that successfully, what we'd usually suggest is you'd go further with uh, variceal band ligation for the GOV type 1. For the other ones, if you've injected glue or thrombin, we'd suggest you go back in about two weeks, and then maybe four to six weeks thereafter, but the data aren't entirely clear what you do with that. There is some evidence that adding in the non-selective beta blocker might be of benefit, but that can be done on a patient-patient basis. And if you fail? If you fail to acutely manage the gastric varices, we would usually suggest a salvage tips. Now that might mean you're just saying stack and tube temporarily to control the situation while you organise that. And if tips is not possible, an interventional radiologist could offer a BRTO, where they do a balloon retrograde occlusion of a feeding vessel and obliterate the vessels that way. I would just point out that tips can also be used for someone in a standard secondary prophylaxis regime where you have rebeating or in selected patients such as a bunch of grapes where you're not in controlling things from injection of glue or thrombin. Is there a role then for primary prophylaxis in gastric varices? The data in this situation are very poor and limited in number. However, the conclusion was from our guidelines was that uh, in selected patients, non-selected beta blockers, which of course reduce the portal pressure, may be of benefit in a selected patient group with gastric varices. And that would usually be a group who have high risk, large gastroesophageal varices type two in the fundus. One study did suggest that injecting, injection of hysteroacryl in a primary prophylaxis situation for gastric varices would have benefit. However, that's not without risk and we feel that many endoscopists and many gastroenterologists would be unhappy uh, putting that risk to the patient in a primary prophylaxis situation. Finally then, can I ask you, what are the key messages that you would have people take away from the discussion today? Okay, I think the th key messages I would suggest would be in the acute setting, if you give antibiotics and you give vasopressors such as terlipressin early, you improve survival. Also, the relatively recent data suggesting a restrictive blood transfusion approach such as aiming for a haemoglobin between 7 and 8 grams per deciliter again improves outcome. With regard to rebleeding, the suggestion is that a combination of non-selective beta blockers and variceal band ligation is the optimal therapy, although there is a role for either alone, depending on the clinical situation. From a primary prophylaxis point of view, we'd suggest that non-selective beta blockers, if there's no contraindication and if tolerated, is the optimal approach with band ligation as an alternative. With regard to gastric varices, hysteracryl injection or possibly thrombin is the endoscopic method of choice and tips would be used for rebeating or in certain selected cases. Okay, thank you Dr Stanley for a fantastic update and an important topic. And thank you for joining us in Digest This.